Good afternoon. My name is Christina Paxson. I'm the president of Brown University, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Stephen A. Ogden Jr. Memorial Lecture on International Affairs. For almost half a century, the Ogden Lecture Series has brought presidents, prime ministers, ambassadors, senators, and at least one king to Providence for presentations that have been among the most distinguished guest lectures Brown has offered, all of them open to the public. Stephen Ogden was a member of the Brown class of 1960, a student of foreign affairs who dreamed of promoting international peace through a career in international relations, a dream that is shared today by so many college and university students. Stephen did not live to realize his dreams. Sadly, he died in 1963 of injuries sustained in an auto accident during his junior year. The Ogden family established this lecture series as a memorial to Stephen and as an encouragement to everyone who shares his dream of international peace. The university is deeply grateful to the Ogden family for its creative vision and generosity and we are pleased that Stephen's sister, Peggy, has joined us for this afternoon's presentation. I, I can't see you, but thank you, Peg. I know you're there. Today, we have a rare opportunity. We have with us a world leader who commands neither an army or a navy, who does not seek to tip the balance of trade or gain an economic advantage, who works to resolve not to exploit the ideological, cultural, religious, and political differences that keep people and nations apart. He has described himself as a simple Buddhist monk, yet his message of peace is the product of a profound and continuing life's work. Born to a farm, farming family in a small village in northeastern Tibet and recognized as the reincarnation of the 13th Dalai Lama when he was only two years old, His Holiness followed a different path of study, reflection, of compassion, and of learning. He began a rigorous monastic education when he was six years old, emerging 17 years later at the highest level of achievement in Buddhist philosophy. He studied art, culture, music, poetry, history, logic, and Buddhist philosophy. His interests, however, are much more extensive, including his sustained dialogue with scientists and theorists in astrophysics, behavioral science, neurobiology, and quantum mechanics. In his 2005 book, The Universe in a Single Atom, The Convergence of Science and Spirituality, he wrote, the great benefit of science is that it can contrib contribute tremendously to the alleviation of suffering at the physical level. But it is only through the cultivation of the qualities of the human heart and the transformation of our attitudes that we can begin to address and overcome our mental suffering. We need both, since the alleviation of suffering must take place at both the physical and psychological levels. Although his training was monastic, His Holiness was called to public life in the spiritual leadership of the Tibetan people in 1950, when he was in his mid-teens. He has carried his message of nonviolence to more than 60 nations on six continents. He has addressed the United Nations, Parliament, members of the US Congress, and the governments of many nations. He has reached out to worldwide religious leaders always advocating for nonviolent solutions even in the face of unspeakable aggression and oppression. The world, not always attentive and sometimes dismissive of peacemakers, has heard him. He's the 1989 Nobel Laureate for Peace, and in March of this year, he was awarded the Templeton Prize, perhaps the highest honor for a religious leader. His tireless travels, his 72 books and his presentations have invited the public to stop, to listen, and to consider the vast potential of a peaceful approach. And so he comes to us today here in Providence, Rhode Island, and it is my great delight to welcome to Providence and to present to you His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama.
Brothers and sisters, and certainly respected president. the president of the famous university. So indeed, I'm very, very happy and a great honor to uh, speak such a big gathering. And also, I think most of, most of you seems, I think, uh, younger generation, students or younger generation. <clears throat> and firstly, I want to show you my real face like that. <laughs> with, with this hat, uh, you cannot see this bold boldness. <laughs> and actually, uh, from here, two sides, more white hair is growing. Uh, this hair, I mean, this side, uh, hair itself, less and less and less. So sometimes something like competition. This this side say, oh, no longer need hair. Uh, this two sides say, oh, need hair, but white. <laughs> so now, in order to see the audience face more clearly, this this kind of sort of hat is very very helpful. Very help. Thank you. <clears throat> Although this visit seems, I think, first time, uh, but whenever I meet people, I always feel we know each other because we are same human being. Mentally, emotionally, physically, we are the same. So from my own experience, from my own sort of feeling, I easily understand what kind of sort of emotions, what kind of mind, what kind of desire in these people's sort of kasoda mind. And then most important, everyone want, everyone want happy life. No one loves suffering. No one loves problem. Even animals want happy life. And because of that sort of desire, by nature, we all have desire to achieve happy life. Therefore, everyone, including animals, have a right to achieve happy life. And everyone has the right to overcome problems or disturbances. So that very much lived with peace. Even animal, peaceful atmosphere, uh, they feel relaxed, happy. 
some disturbances come, then they become tense, uh, more stress. We human beings also. So peace itself, not something sacred, but we want, we need that peace because we want happy life. Do not want suffering. So violence always brings fear. Fear increases tension, stress, frustration. Then that uh, usually, you see, uh, creates violence. So violence often creates more violence. So therefore, uh, reality, well, the reality is we want happy life. Happiness very much related with peace. So our emotional, certain sort of, our sort of the narrow-minded views, when we face some sort of problems, we feel, oh, use force and destroy that. That gain victory, our long-lasting happiness. This is wrong. That kind of attitude is wrong. So then, uh, I think I'm a person uh, whose age now over 77 year old. Almost my whole life, you uh, see, some kind of violent world. I born uh, 30, 19. uh, 1935. Then soon after, and then already I think some violence, some sort of invasion in China. Some problems, some violence uh, already started. Then soon, and then Nazi power also in growing. So then, soon after, Second World War. Then, Korean War, Vietnam War. And also including a lot of sort of civil wars, or okay? civil war or some Regional. disturbances. Regional wars. Regional wars. So when I look back, the major part of my life, that means in the 20th century, since 1960, 1935, uh, that century sadly become a century of bloodshed. I think immense of violence. And some, some of the great achievement from scientific research work also turned for violence. That's atomic bomb. So actually, two atom bomb dropped in Japan. One Hiroshima, one Nagasaki. I had sort of opportunity to visit these two places. And my first, I think, first or second visit to uh, Japan, one occasion, actually I met some sort of victims, survivors, survivors of nuclear bomb. Really terrible. So the immense violence, if create better world, then you may say, oh, that immense violence produce some good thing. So can justify that. That's not the case. Beginning of this 21st century, uh, 
uh, some sort of location, some violence here and there. These also, I think, symptom of the 20th century's mistake or negligence, and including these now, because of suicide or terrorism. Or terrorism, yes, terrorism. These also symptom of the last century's negligence or some mistakes. So therefore, now we have to think seriously uh, how to build a more peaceful world. Uh, this 21st century should be a peaceful century. And peace means does not mean no longer any problem. Problem always remains there. I think, frankly speaking, so long we human beings remain on this planet, some kind of problems always happen. <laughs> because these problems start from here. It's too much sort of uh, expectation. Uh, expectation, too much sort of ambition, like that. And this too much sort of expectation, the ambition, combined with extreme self-centered blindness. Blindness. These two things combine. The trouble bound to happen. So therefore, uh, I think uh, sir, uh, Latin America may also uh, Mayan, Mayan civilization. Oh, Mayan, Mayan civilization. Uh, some of my friend told me, according to their civilization, their calendar. Ka, the, according to their calendar. Uh, the 2012 is the end of the world. Now already October. <laughs> but the world still remains here. <laughs> if world. And in a way, very sad, frightened. In a way, good. No longer problems now. <laughs> so therefore, so long we human beings with different interests, different concept, different views, well, the source of problem remains. So then what to do? Yes, consider others' view is view of human being. Others' interest also interest of the human being. We are part of humanity. So here, once we accept their problem is my problem, their happiness, my happiness. Seven billion human beings happy. Automatically, I get maximum benefit. Seven billion human beings, some trouble. How I can escape from that? Because we are social animals. Secondly, today's world heavily interdependent. Economy, environment, and many others heavily interdependent. Therefore, something happened there, the repercussion reach your own side. So therefore, for our own interest, for our own individual interest, we have to look the, I say, the interest of others. So, so that is the, the basis of development of proper, meaningful dialogue. Once you respect others' view, others' right, others' interest, then about conflict, about sort of, I mean, danger, I mean, danger was start. Talk. If something happened, you will be loser. I also will suffer, no benefit. So we have to find a way to solve this mutually equipped solution. That's the only way. That's the dialogue. So therefore, I usually describe this 21st century should be century of dialogue. So now, here I want to 
uh, to address mainly the youth. Now, I often ask age. Now here, the, uh, those people whose age below uh, 30, please raise hand. Hmm? Good. Now, below 20. And below 15. So in any way, you know, those people, I usually describe those people whose age below 30, 20, 15, these people are generation of 21st century. Uh, those people, uh, more or less same age, uh, my age, <laughs> 70 uh, or 60, 50, we are generation of 20th century. So our century, gone. <laughs> now we are uh, ready to say, Bye bye. <laughs> so now, this 21st century, only 12 years, almost 12 years passed. Uh, over, where that? Uh, around eight, 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 eight. Uh, 88 years yet to come. So, pre past, present, future. Past is past, only memory. Of course, we can learn some experience from the past, but otherwise, already gone, nothing. We cannot change that. Some totalitarian regimes change past history. <laughs> That's, I think, uh, additional problem. <laughs> past is past, whether good or bad already happened. Now, important is future. Future still in our hand. Whether you see future uh, more happier one or troubled one, still in our hand, mainly hand of 21st century. Uh, generation of 21st century. So now, I always was urging or request the generation uh, who belongs to the 21st century, now please think more seriously and try to look different angle and different sort of way, way should not take for granted how uh, up to now we lead this kind of sort of thinking. So that will sort of solve a problem that will go on like that. That I think a mistake. The reality change, changed, much changed. And year by year still changing. So in order to carry realistic sort of approach, uh, our percept, our, our perception, our perception must be uh, realistic. And in order to carry a realistic approach, we must have full of knowledge about reality. We have to act according to new reality. Reality changed. Our perception remains still old way. Perception. Then this gap. Oh reality and our perception become I mean, bigger, bigger, bigger. Then all our sort of effort will not achieve satisfactory result because our effort become 
unrealistic. Therefore, younger generation, now think more seriously and should not sort of concentrate your own sort of family, your own community, your own city, or even your own nation. You must look beyond. You must look entire Kaza, world. entire world. Some scientists are very busy uh, to study about Mars, <laughs> moons, Mars. Of course, very interesting. <laughs> but firstly, we should look our troubled world. <laughs> so let them investigate what is the age of these things. Uh, uh, from there, we may learn how big in this world, this planet, uh, and how will uh, how, how will change, right? how will end this world. This is also interesting. But we are sort of immediate sort of what's it there? Life depend on this blue planet. So you have to look seriously. World as a one entity, including environment. You must pay serious attention about environment issue. This is the question of our survival. Then also at global level, even national level, this gap, rich and poor, this is also source of problem. Not only morally wrong, but practically also source of problem. We have to think seriously this gap rich and poor. One time in Washington, I, when I give some sort of, of talk, I mentioned the Washington, the, the richest sort of nation's capital. I think consumers were. Consumers consumer were very high. High, high, consumption, high, high. consumption level, very high. Oh. So, capital of that kind of nation, yeah. but suburb of Washington, there are many poor people. In this area, sometimes people say, unsafe area. Who created that unsafe? From birth? No. Their economic condition, their life, poor, difficult. Therefore, some frustration. As I mentioned earlier, frustration then creates uh, violence. So therefore, you see, we have to look seriously how to reduce this gap, rich and poor. So these two things, uh, I really feel very, very important in order to build happy century of the uh, to the first century. So our main responsibility on younger people's shoulder, not my shoulder. <laughs> we, we, a generation who belongs to the, to the century, now we, I think time come, relax and watching these young people, whether they really carry seriously or not, we're just watching you. So main responsibility lying on your shoulder. So think. Now here, some people say, some people may feel a problem, immense. So one individual cannot do much. Just something like big wave. One person, so as if, if, if you are being swept away by a huge wave, one individual cannot really rise above the dead tide. Should not feel that kind of thing. I think firstly, judging events in 20th century, it seems quite clear. 
early part of the 20th century, later part of the 20th century, I think among the changes, many of them were very positive, very hopeful. I think firstly, up to 1960-70, the threat of nuclear holocaust was really there because two blocks ready to use nuclear weapons. But that gone. And I think the very factor which removed Berlin Wall, not by force, but by popular movement. And Soviet Union, East Bloc, changed, mainly their own people's peaceful. as a peaceful movement. So many areas in the Philippines, one time Marco, total, totalitarian. totalitarian dictator, that also disappeared because of their own popular movement. And Chile, also like that. So, so therefore, you see, the, uh, within the same century, you see, the big change, now later part of the 20th century, I think peace, genuine peace on at least the European continent, I think Kosovo or something, otherwise I think comparatively peace. During Cold War, surface some peace there, but that peace, not genuine peace, that kind of peace out of fear. That's not genuine peace. After Berlin Wall collapse, or the Soviet sort of empire changed. Then, you see the genuine peace eventually now come. I think in 1950s, uh, 60s, nobody expect that kind of change, one thing. Second, another thing, environment issue. In early part of the 20th century, I think nobody uh, have some kind of sense of concern or awareness, the importance of ecology. Nobody feel we also have the responsibility to take care of our planet. Later part of the 20th century, even political party, so-called Green Party, in many countries, originally, you see, they're very much concerned about ecology. So, the, on, the, on the basis of ecological sort of, what's it, uh, concern, they uh, establish new political party. Uh, political party. Nowadays, I don't know. Some of these parties now they also now involve uh, their own sort of interest or because of party politics like that I don't know, but originally like that. So sometimes uh, uh, I sort of, sort of jokingly is telling when I meet some you see the Green Party's uh, sort of members or politicians. So sometimes I, I jokingly tell them, oh, these people is very supportive about our, our cause. So sometimes I tell them, if I join uh, any political party, I will join Green Party. <laughs> so like that. These are, I think, sign, a sign of progress in our human mind or knowledge. One thing. Then another thing. Science and spirituality. In the past, completely something separate. Now, I think quantum physics, you see, these, you see, shows the you know, importance of our subjects. Uh, experience, perception. Uh, uh, subjects of perception or subject sight. Uh, so meantime, some top scientists, now they 
uh, feel, begin to feel. Uh, we cannot treat human being as a machine, but we must pay more attention about human emotions, human mind, particularly in the uh, medical science. Now they really now talking much about uh, about human emotions. For preventive measure, illness, peaceful mind, or sort of city, optimistic sort of mental attitude is very essential. Uh, then, uh, even you you get some illness, the recover again optimistic attitude, sort of some kind of sort of the strong sort of mental attitude, very important for recover. So for these reasons, now some scientists really showing interest, uh, cultivate human mind, compassion, uh, love these things. So actually some universities, mainly in this country, and also some some, I think, other countries also, like Europe and also India. You see, carrying some kind of experimental project. Right. Oh. For example, some Emory University, uh, I think mainly Emory University, uh, and, and so on, some, some university. You see, the last few years, you see, they carry some sort of experiment sort of project. Uh, and some people, see, trained two weeks, three weeks, certain kind of mindfulness, and also, you see, uh, also learn the, the, about compassion or practice of compassion. Before they start, they carry examination, their physical condition, blood pressure, amount of stress, or these things, they examine. Then after uh, two, three weeks, again check. Blood pressure reduce. Amount of stress also reduce. As a result, person become much happier. And their attitude towards uh, other sort of friends, much more sort of healthier. healthier. So these things now, in scientific research field, now study about emotion, how to deal with these emotions. That, I think, one sort of big change, I feel. Uh, so one time, in in 1996, I had so sort of privilege the the Queen Mother of England. Her own age, uh, 96. So I, since my childhood, as a result of seeing you see, her picture and her husband, uh, King George VI. Uh, so I have some sort of admiration. So when I had audience, the Queen Mother, a very nice, uh, uh, very nice lady. So when I, uh, when we sat down, sat down uh, then I asked, since you observed almost whole 20th century, so, according to your experience, the world becoming better or worse or same, without hesitation, immediately she responded me, better. Then she put some reasons. When she was young, nobody talks about human rights or right of self-determination. 
And nowadays, human right and right of self-determination, these are universal values. concept or universal sort of values. values. So she mentioned that. So therefore, uh, there are a lot of sort of, I said, the example, human thinking, human behavior, through our own difficult experiences, that gradually our mind become more mature. Then, I think one sort of another important thing is early part of the 20th century, when nation declare war on their so-called enemy. Uh, the, every citizen of the country, without any question, they proudly join war effort. Since the Vietnam War, that kind of situation changed. Look, uh, in this century, well, early, part this, early part of this century, Iraq War about to start. Millions of people against war from Australia uh, and up to Europe and the United States, up to the United States. Oh. So these are clear signs, the desire for peace. Now really, uh, sorry, not just a slogan, but real desire. Yeah. Strong. Strong, like that. So then another thing, I think including scientists, they're also now showing interest about our inner value in order to build happy person, happy family, happy society, uh, healthy body. Uh, other hand, the, among the affluent, materially affluent society, uh, now people begin to feel limitation of material value. In the past, material sort of facility, material value is the ultimate sort of the source of happiness. So all our hopes put on that. Actually, the, the very education system oriented about material value. Now, many educationists, many sort of rich people, now they begin to feel material values, there's limitation. More material sort of success, more greed. Uh, that brings too much sort of extreme competition. And that brings suspicion. That brings distrust. And though some of these sort of very successful sort of people in deep insight, lonely feeling. Because they too much because of the self-centered sort of attitude, so they cannot trust people. So finally, lonely feeling. So that also, I think, big change. Now, more and more people, uh, including scientists, now showing uh, deeper sort of human reality. That is human mind, human emotion. So various spirituality deal with emotions, these things. So modern science and spirituality also seems to come closer and closer. These are, I think, the, these events, I think really, because uh, of the, provide, provide. Of the um, shows our hope. We becoming more mature. Uh, so now, make attempt, use our intelligence, a more holistic way, try to find new way for approach. Certainly, this century can be more peaceful, more pleasant, 
I think actually we can develop this century or century of compassion, compassionate century. We can do that. Now compassion, or love, affection. Sometimes the people consider these are religious practice. Now here we must just make a distinction. All major religious tradition is their main message, main practice, yes, practice of love, compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, self-discipline, contentment, all these things. Yeah. Irrespective of what philosophical differences. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are a large number of people out of seven billion human beings who have not much interest about religious faith. So then these people usually, oh, practice of love, compassion, forgiveness, these are religious practice. So since they have no interest about religion, they also completely ignore about these values. That's a mistake. Whether I accept religion or not, that's up to individual. You can remain a good human being without religious faith. It's possible. We noticed. Uh, however, uh, these people, if you examine, like some of the scientists, atheists, no religious belief, but through their own investigation, now they realize uh, more warm-heartedness is immense helpful for health, for happy family, like that. So therefore, uh, we must find a way to promote these uh, values, not relying on religion. That I usually call secular way approach. These values, uh, basically biological factor, not related with religious belief. Even animal, dogs, cats, some birds, you see, they also have this some I mean, ability of limited altruism to their own surrounding friend, like that. So these are biological factors, because it need for their own survival. And particularly social animal, for their survival, cooperation is very essential. Cooperation based on because of the uh, sense of community, like that, and love like that. So therefore, uh, uh, those people who have not much interest about religion, they should not neglect about these inner values. So the approach to promote these things should be secular way. And then I must sort of make clear, in the West, when the word secularism comes, then some people feel the secularism means little sort of negative towards religion. Uh, that's uh, one sort of understanding. According to India, secularism, they understand, they respect all religions, no preference this religion or that religion, equally respect, and then also respect non-believer. I think that's very wise. India, when independent country, in, I mean, in, came, independent. came to independent nation, their constitution based on secularism. Because the reality, they are already that country multi-religious nation, multi-culture, multi-linguistic. 
so mainly multi religious sort of society. Therefore, the constitution uh, developed on the basis of secularism. So all those Indian sort of father, nation's father, right? Founding fathers. Found, uh, founding fathers. Founding fathers is who create this secularism or India's today's constitution based on secularism. These people, individually, very, very religious-minded people, like Mahatma Gandhi and the first president of India, Rajendra Prasad, and also the daughter Ambirka, all these lawyer and the member of the committee who make this constitution like that. So therefore, the secularism, when I use the secularism, means, according to that understanding, respect all religions, uh, and including non-believer. Non uh, so uh, I usually you see, or say they making effort to promote human value uh, through secular approach. So these are, so then the challenge in our world, the population increasing, lifestyle increasing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this huge gap, rich and poor, the poorer section of people, global level or national level, we have to lift their living standard. Oh. So, their consumes rare, consume, or their lifestyle will change. So that also, you see, create uh, more challenges. Uh, so the other day in was MIT, MIT, you see some discussions or panel discussion with some scientist in particular field, really expert. You see their presentation, the different field, ecology, economy, and Korea. Food. Ah, food. food in many, many fields. Oh, their presentation really, truly shows their expertise in this field. So they, everybody, every field, they create, I mean, they mentioned the challenges, immense challenges. Also, you see, they mentioned there is possibility to overcome. All this related ultimately human will. That will also, you see, human sort of sense of concern of well-being of the world, or, or other, of other. Others. So, uh, so, after all, all human activities, you see, uh, whether uh, constructive or destructive, ultimately lead with motivation. Every action motivated by sense of concern of others' well-being, then all action then really become a constructive action. Every action, any action motivated by extreme self-centered selfish motivation. Don't care about other. In worse, exploit other, bully other, cheating other, telling lies other, or killing other. Uh, so, so this, any action out of uh, negative motivation, uh, motivation then uh, every action becomes destructive action. So we have to think more about motivation here. Now here, uh, how can how can sort of train this moral principle? secular way, not from teaching, not from church, not from temple, but from education field, from kindergarten up to university level, we must pay more attention or educate people or make awareness the ultimate source of happiness, ultimate source of successful life is to depend here. So that existing education sort of institution 
please pay more attention. The president and teachers, professors, please think more. And, and you, you yourself also, you see, worthwhile to carry some uh, further sort of experiment or investigation. That, I think, very important. And then those, uh, the generation who belongs to the first century, you, you, uh, you also, you see, still think more, not only money, money, or successful in the terms of money, not sufficient. Successful very much related with inner peace. Also, it's very important. So think uh, both material successful, material values, successful. Right. Material, success. material, success. Success. material success, and also inner peace. These two things uh, should keep in your mind. So that's about my talk. Now some questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Your Holiness, for sharing so much of your time and wisdom with us today. It's just been a great honor to have you here in Providence, and your, your words are inspirational. We do have some time for questions, and to help facilitate this, we have actually videotaped some questions in advance from members of our audience, and they will appear in screens around the room. Uh, these are from students and faculty from Brown and students from local high schools. And so while we may not have time to get to all of the questions we videotaped, uh, many thanks to those of you who provided us with questions. And I actually have the questions written down in case it doesn't work. Are we good? Okay. Okay, what? New one. <laughs> now two. Okay. Oh. So, so let's, let's give this a shot. Our, our first question is from Tibetan student Lobsang Lama. Lobsang is studying electrical engineering and economics at Brown. So let's see if it plays. Kasa. Ashidile and greetings, Your Holiness. My name is Lapsang Lama, and I'm a member of the class of 2014. My question is, how should the younger generations of today contribute and participate towards building global peace? I think I already answered that. <laughs> so. No use to repeat. Too much repetition. Audience may feel boring. <laughs> Next. Next. OK. <laughs> Our next question is from Awa Kubasa, a senior at Pawtucket's Tolman High School. Awa has a 4.0 GPA, plays various sports, and juggles two jobs outside of school. Kasa. Hello, Your Holiness. My name is Awa Kubasa, and I'm a senior at Tolman High School in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. If our purpose in life is to be happy, then why is it that certain individuals' happiness causes pain for others? Uh, I think, firstly, I always believe uh, the very purpose of our life, our existence, for happiness. Reason, uh, our life, no guarantee, happy life, but our life depends on Hope. Hope means something good. 
once individual completely lost hope, then that mental attitude itself shortened our life. Then worst case, suicide also used to happen. And also less hope, and then uh, relying on, what say the drugs, alcohol. This almost as a house, something like suicide. Ruin your own body, ruin your own sharp intelligence, like that. So, the very purpose of our life is happy life. There's no question. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, usually self-centered attitude with that motivation, seeking your own sort of joyful or happy life, regardless of on other, that sometimes is causing some problem other. But actually, that kind of sort of self-cherishing is foolish. I usually use it telling, we are selfish. That means take care of oneself. That's very important. Without sort of feeling, taking care of oneself, how can extend that feeling of care of other? Some people self-hated there. Such people, impossible to extend love and compassion to others. So therefore, the taking care of oneself is very right and very sort of important. But, Anyway, selfish sort of attitude that should be combined with awareness, combined with wisdom. So that I usually call that kind of selfish is wise selfish. Just think oneself, uh, concern oneself, don't care about other, even exploit other, harming other. That kind of selfish is foolish selfish. Long run. Self-destruction. So therefore, the positive, wise sort of selfish is, you see, never create problem other, but rather bring some sort of the happiness, some benefit to other. So that's my answer. Do you agree that? <laughs> Next question. Thank you very much. The next question is from Elizabeth Hoover, assistant professor at Brown, where she teaches Native American studies courses. Greetings, Your Holiness. I'm Professor Elizabeth Hoover. I'm descended from the Mohawk and Mi'kmaq tribes of upstate New York and eastern Canada. I traveled to Tibet in 2010, and I witnessed your people there being treated by the Chinese much in the same way that our indigenous people here in the Americas have been treated. I was wondering, from the perspective of an indigenous person who has been separated from your homeland, what advice do you give to your own people who are currently suffering from the forced changes to their culture, and how would you advise native people here who are working to recover from the same experiences? Now, right from the beginning, when we become a refugee, and I think even further, uh, 1949, 50, the new situation developed, uh, we urging Tibetan unity. Uh, and importance of our own cultural heritage. We have our own language, our own script. It is completely independent from Chinese script and Indian script. Although originally Tibetan script uh, copied based on, or based on some of the Indian sort of writing system. Uh, writing system. Uh, 
but itself completely sort of independence. Uh, then after 59, we become refugee. Our first priority is education, uh, modern education. And that modern education also is not just one-sided modern education, but including Tibetan traditional education, including language and Buddhist philosophy, these things. So therefore, uh, 59, we came to India, become refugee. Uh, within a year, we start school for education. That school, since you see, we want to develop or produce Tibetan student, see, both field, traditional or education and modern education. So we ask Indian government, we want a separate Tibetan school. Then Pandit Nehru he, uh, Indian Prime Minister, he fully support that. So we establish separate Tibetan school. And government of India set up uh, a society for Tibetan school like that. So we always you see, uh, how should they give importance of preservation of our own, our own identity. The most important part of identity is our language, our script, and our culture. So our sort of main criticism to the Chinese communist authorities in Tibet, they sometimes, sadly, they deliberately to, to suppress Tibetan unique sort of culture, or including sometimes including our language also, they uh, also uh, suppress like that. Yeah. Now, the outside world, I had a number of occasions meeting with indigenous people in New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, or Okinawa, uh, Okinawa, Hawaii, uh, and then uh, here, America and South Europe. Ah, South, America. Uh, South America. So whenever I meet these people, firstly I told them, nowadays, unlike past, the world sort of recognize each individual, each individual communities, their own language, their own culture, uh, is something really worthwhile to preserve. So new opportunity comes. So people uh, have every right to carry all sorts of work for preservation of their own culture, their own language, their own identity. Uh, uh, meantime, I always ask them, uh, do you have some writing system. your own writing system? Uh, writing system? Many of them say, no writing system. Then I urging them, oh, you should invent one sort of writing. Uh, preservation, effective preservation, long run, relying on oral tradition. Uh, tradition. Uh, not sufficient. Not ah. secure. No, not secure. Uh, and then I notice some native people, particularly in Latin America, in order to preserve their own culture, their own identity, they prefer remain isolated. That I feel mistake. Uh, like the uh, Maori in New Zealand, they thoroughly educated with the rest of the New Zealand people. 
meantime, they speak their own language, and their own, some, they practice their own traditions. And also, northern part of Scandinavian countries, the local, through modern education, like in Nor Norway, the northern part of Norway, the Sami land, they thoroughly educated with normal Norwegian people. And meantime, they preserve their own identity, their own dress, their own songs, like that. So that's the proper way. Through that, through modern education, preserve their own culture, their own language or identity, then more effective. Isolate, almost like suicide, no use. So now American natives or Indians, many occasions, many places I met. Uh, again, sometimes you see, I ask the population, uh, they say, some cases they say uh, 2,000, 3,000. That I think too small, difficult. Uh, so I think the more similar sort of linguistic way. Tribes that have tribes, that share greater similarities. Then should, I think, create some sort of written, writing system. Uh, writing system. Writing system. Then more cooperative way and uh, what is that? Uh, preservation of their own identity, their own language. One thing, uh, in Australian uh, indigenous people, one occasion so I met some, and then I told, I asked, is their, when they introduced their, themselves, you see, their name is uh, the Christian names or English names. Then I suggested at least individual name should be a native language so that is the individual himself or herself, you see, the mentioned name is, uh, reminds you, you are the particular sort of tribes or community. So I, uh, few, some occasion, I suggest like that. So that also, I think, can be helpful to, uh, to, uh, to, to remind the individual I belong this tribe or that tribe. So that's my view. Uh, then perhaps I think mm, a little funny thing. Uh, few, uh, I, think, I think at least 20, 15, 20 years ago, one occasion in Frankfurt, in Germany, there's one meeting uh, Different people. Indigenous people. Uh, indigenous people. Indigenous people. Well, also some Germans there, some organization. Uh, so one representative from one American indigenous uh, Indian, uh, one representative. See, so he read one long speech or written speech, uh, message from his own, uh, I think, religious. Leader, chief. Uh, chief. So that letter is mentioned. He wish all white people should expel from American continent. <laughs> I, I think that is a little bit extreme. <laughs> I think if white people, uh, even you see, as a withdraw. Oh, then these big cities then become like ghost town. Right? <laughs> no use. I think we'll suffer global economy immensely. <laughs> so these are a little bit too, too extreme, like that. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. We, we have time for one more question. And this question is from medical student Tara Schetzel Hill. And uh, let's hear. Her. 
medical student. Good afternoon, Your Holiness. My name is Tara Schetzel Hill, and I am a medical student at the Warren Albert Medical School. In light of the recent events in the Middle East, hearing news of the violent protests, as well as the anti American sentiments that have been sweeping that part of the world, sometimes feels frightening and alarming. So, my question is how can we view and process these events from a peace centered perspective? And how can we cultivate a peaceful response to circumstances that seem scary and threatening? This quite, uh, firstly, I think quite serious and also complicated. Uh, complicated question. Uh, after September 11th uh, event happened, then after one year, one commemoration, commemoration uh, take place in Washington National Cathedral. Uh, so some way, somehow I was there at that time. So they invited me to participate in that sort of uh, spiritual sort of ceremony. Then I expressed the due to such sort of the mischievous people's what is it, action. Uh, their background, uh, bronze Muslim. So some mischievous Muslim sort of behavior. And with that generalized whole Islam or Muslim community, that's unfair. Some mischievous people in every religious community among the Buddhists, among the Christians, among the Jews, among the Hindus, everywhere. So these handful mischievous people's activities will not represent the whole community or whole this sort of concept or tradition. So since then, I always you see defending Islam, also is one of the important world religion. Uh, so, so you see, uh, I, because I feel isolate them, then you see the unnecessary sort of the uh, distrust or suspicion. Uh, and recently, sometimes even books mentioned clash Islam and Western civilization. Uh, Western civilization. And these are, I think, not, uh, what should they, uh, I think not, not, not based on reality. The reality, the Islam world need West. West need the, uh, those Middle East uh, nations, and also, firstly, oil, these things. So heavily interdependent. So therefore, firstly, uh, if you uh, develop more kasoda, more contact, then people, you see, uh, kasoda, then you see these kind of distrust will not come or diminish. So creation, some kind of wrong impression is, uh, I think, a mistake. Uh, so I personally also know uh, among the Muslim, there are genuine uh, practitioner, or uh, g among the genuine Islam practitioner, wonderful people there, I know. So one Muslim, my friend, you see, he stated, he said, 
He says, the genuine Islam practitioner must extend love towards entire creator of Allah. Any Muslim who, who create bloodshed is reality no longer Islam practitioner. They say like that. So there are many good Muslims there. So we should not generalize. So we must extend, reach out, reach out, reach out Muslim world. That's, I think, important. Uh, then secondly, I think first that, uh, uh, that also is, I think, their side also is much depend on the education uh, and environment. I notice Muslims in India, Muslims in Malaysia, Muslims in Indonesia, different. Same Quran, same Muslim, five times prayer, same. Because of Ramadan, sorry. Ramadan, Ramadan practice is the same, but the, the environment, because of due to different environment, the Indian Muslims, from their childhood, they accept their multi religions already there. The recently, I met one Romanian who carries some investigation or research work. India's religious harmony. Uh, I met in one uh, Indian state, Rajasthan, M many Muslims there. So uh, one occasion I visit there, you see the, uh, I met in that Romanian, or see the researchers. He told me, he surprised, he found one Muslim village Village means at least few thousand Muslim population must be there. Uh, so then he found in that village three Hindu families. Three, three, Hindu. Uh, three Hindu families. Uh, three Hindu, Hindu families. No fear. Completely safe among the bigger Muslim sort of uh, community. Very friendly. So therefore, you see, the Indian Muslim, they develop that way. So their attitude very much sort of was the harmony sort of as of that. Spirit. Uh, spirit. So like that. Uh, uh, so this environment makes uh, differences. Uh, so we, Muslim world, traditionally, not much contact with outside world or Western world. I think it is not sufficient in some uh, uh, technology, taking oil mm, on a particular area and not much contact with the rest of the community. That's not sufficient. Or meeting with some leaders, some kings of their families, and, uh, that's not sufficient. I think education field, more uh, interaction, uh, more interaction, more contact. I think uh, that's very, very important. If possible, like uh, your university, you see, should invite some student from these different Arab countries and give them education and sort of training. I think very, very important. So that's my view. Then eventually, uh, otherwise you see this, uh, now with the help of modern technology, sometimes there's unexpected some explosions or some expected sort of self, the, the terrorist actions. That really, you see, uh, creates some kind of uh, fear or uncomfortable sort of things. So that's also quite true. So, but we have to, uh, we have yeah. to, uh, make effort, uh, make effort, long term. 
So this after 10, after uh, September 11th event, is I mentioned, I expressed many occasions. If you handle not properly this problem, then, uh, you see, today, or at that time I mentioned today, one bin Laden, then the next 10 bin Laden, then 100 bin Laden, possible. So we must find non-violent way approach and based on strong, genuine spirit of brotherhood, sisterhood, oneness of the humanity on the same planet. I think we can, uh, we can reach out through this way. Uh, so Tibetan and Chinese is after uh, a 2008 crisis, the Chinese government, their hardliners, deliberately create some kind of impression. Entire Tibetans are anti-Chinese. Actually not. So then, uh, immediately after that year, whenever I visit Europe, America, uh, Australia, some Chinese demonstrations, demonstrators, uh, always sort of follow. <laughs> uh, we always try to reach out to the Chinese community. Whenever I had we have opportunity meeting them, telling them uh, about truth. So then, uh, gradually, uh, year by year, the days uh, reduce. Uh, out of sort of understanding, out of sort of stay, uh, right. uh, more closer sort of contact. relations, contact like that. So that, that much I know. Then beyond that, I don't know. Like that. I, I'd like everybody to join me in thanking His Holiness for coming to talk to Thank us you. today. Oh yes. So I really, I really enjoy having this opportunity. So please think some of these my points. If you feel some interest, then think more. And you yourself investigate these things. Uh, uh, and then try to share with more people. If you feel these points not much relevant, not much interest, then forget. No problem. <laughs> Thank you.